so we, we just had a really, I think, uh, insightful conversation around um, why it can be so difficult to be patient and what, would, what might make being patient a little bit easier. Uh, the scholars have, when they, speaking, when they speak about patience, and we're talking about patience as one of the fruits of faith, the idea that if we're able to really work on our spirituality, on our relationship with Allah, it actually becomes easier in our daily life to be patient. And uh, inevitably, we all at some point have to demonstrate patience. Imam al-Ghazali, he says that, he says, you know, in life, there's really just two types of situations you find yourself in. Situations that you deem favorable, that like you think are in your favor and you, you're happy with that situation. And situations where you're a little bit unhappy, they're unfavorable. You wish they could be otherwise. He says it really just falls into one of two. You're okay with the situation or you wish that it could be different. Imam al-Ghazali, he tells us that actually you need to show patience in both. Because some of us might think, no, I need to show patience in the situation that's unfavorable. The one that I don't like, that I wish would be different. That's the one I need to be patient in. If the situation is good, like I really enjoy it, and I'm happy with the situation, where, where do I need to be patient and this is where we can also begin to uh, reflect on the meaning of patience. I think we've been speaking about patience, and we, I think we commonly speak about patience in a very particular meaning. Uh, me, the meaning of when we face a difficulty or a challenge, and we have to kind of bear it. That process of bearing it is patience. That's kind of how we use the word. But scholars would use the word sabr, patience, to refer to any time an individual has to hold themselves back. Habsun nafs. Hold themselves back. So in a, in a difficult situation, it makes sense. There's a difficult situation and you have to hold yourself back from what? What do you have to hold yourself back from in a situation that's unfavorable? You have to hold yourself back from losing hope. Beautiful. What else? Outward behavior? Yeah, you have to hold yourself back from behaviors that are not healthy, that are not good, for sure. You have to hold yourself back from complaining, objecting to Allah's decisions. You have to hold yourself back from uh, doing things because we can become impatient and then to make it happen, we might adopt a method that's haram. Because we're impatient. We can't wait for it to come in a halal way. So we go through a haram you know, path to get to what we want. So sabr in that situation is to hold myself back from doing that. Because a part of me wants to. Whatever it takes, right? Whatever it takes to get me out of this unfavorable situation. Now, in a situation where things are good... What sabr is required there? I mean, everything's good. The situation's enjoyable. So why would you have to hold yourself back? What holding back is required here? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, becoming arrogant about it. Beautiful, yeah. Overindulging, yes. That's one of the main ones the scholars talk about, yeah. Showing off. Absolutely, arrogance showing off. But overindulgence is one of the main reasons that they say a person has to learn to hold back in favorable, favorable times. And the reason, and, and many of the scholars would say that it's actually harder. It's actually harder to demonstrate sabr, that self-restraint in the face of good times. Why do you think that is? Anyone? Why would that be? Yeah. Right, greed. You're describing the hadith with the Prophet ﷺ. He said that 
لو أن لبني آدم واديا من ذهب. If the child of Adam, a human being, had a whole valley of gold, they would want two valleys. So when Allah gives us something, we overindulge because of our greed is what you're saying. Beautiful, yeah. Okay. That's that's great. That's beautiful. Um, it, she said it's harder to resist something that's literally right there. Like like you're at home and you're just craving some some food, right? Until you you can resist it if it, if, <clears throat> if you just choose not to order it. Once you've ordered it and it's there on the table, then try to hold back. It's like, bro, I can't. It's right there. You know what I mean? Like. So long as it doesn't reach my house, I could just be like, well, I don't have it, so I can't eat it anyways, right? Yeah, go ahead. Lack of understanding and gratitude. Okay, yeah, I see where you're coming from. Um, that's, that is one of the potential fears when you have all this good in front of you. Overindulgence, the scholars mention, is that the, the challenge with over or holding yourself back from o- overindulgence is that your guard is down. Your guard is down. You know when things are really good? Y- you're not really kind of second guessing. You're not asking yourself, what about this? What about that? You're, you're just happy. You're just overjoyed. Do you get it? And so it's so easy in that moment to forget about what's the appropriate approach here. Um, what is the, have you ever seen children? Like a child, once something's in front of them, like a toy that they want, you ever try to talk to them? Be like, hey, they're just, they want a toy, so you bring it out, you put it over there. And then you, you bring the child and they see the toy and they're like, and they're just thinking about it. And you, and you say, listen, listen, I want to tell you something before you go play with it. They hear nothing. They hear nothing. They're just thinking about the toy. They're just so locked in. And you might even tell them, hey, listen, make sure when you play with the toy, share with your friends. You give them a whole bunch of advice. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and they're saying, yeah, to just get you off, right? Leave me alone. Let me go play with my toy. And then when they go to play with their toy, they don't remember any of the advice you gave them. That's, some, that's sometimes how we are as adults. We're just sophisticated children in, 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 in some instances, right? Something comes before us that we really like and we lose all sense of what's the right thing to do here? What's a healthy amount of investment in this situation? And we can go all in to an unhealthy like, amount and level so the scholars mentioned that actually demonstrating self-restraint in the face of good times is, is actually far more difficult. Because in difficult times, what happens? You naturally do what? Ask yourself, like, wait, what's going on here? You become reflective. You step back and go, wait, why are things not working out? What's going on? Is something wrong with me, them? And you start to ask yourself, and what's the best approach? Maybe I'm, maybe I'm not approaching it the right way. And so it's much easier in that situation to demonstrate self-restraint because there's so much more reflection going on. Yeah. Yeah, the marshmallow test was used to try to predict uh, in the future the success of the child based on their ability to resist immediate gratification. And the idea is that in life, you're going to have to do it. So the children who at a young age had been trained and had the cognitive capacity and ability to restrain themselves and hold off, um, they, they, there's research like as they followed those kids into adolescence and then as they got older, that they did better in their studies and stuff because 
you know, as you get older, there's a lot of distractions. And if you're able to like hold yourself back, then you can actually focus on what needs to be focused on. So I think that's what that study was about. There's definitely factors. I, I think we cannot deny that there's definitely factors related to a person's personality and biology, for sure. Right? Even just the de development of the prefrontal cortex and the ability to, because that's the ex you know, executive processing part of the brain, essentially. So that's where it can kind of think about the situation and go, no, this is not good. Young children often can't really think through it. And if they can, it might be because of their willingness to listen to authority. It might be they don't feel sensations as, as strongly. They're not so sensitive to pain compared to other children. Have you ever seen that? Like, like even, even adults, we have different levels of pain tolerance, just naturally. It's not even a matter of learning it. So some people are very sensitive to even a little bit of discomfort. It just, it's so hard for them to overcome that. And for others, they have a very, you could say, high threshold of pain tolerance. So there is an inner pain we experience when we want something and, we, and, and we're not able to get it. And so how strongly do you feel that urge? And then, of course, the nurture of, you know, as a young child, was this child given everything they want? Were they made to practice the ability to restrain themselves? So I think it was both, for sure. And I'm glad you brought that up, for sure. It's, a, it's an element. Um, so Imam al-Ghazali, he mentions that there's two scenarios, really, every single time. Either it's favorable or it's not. And in both situations, there's a degree of self-restraint that's required. And it's hard. Because you don't have to teach somebody to want to move forward. You don't have to teach someone that. You have to teach them how to restrain. Children, you don't have to teach them to like candy. They just like candy or, you know, whatever candy it is or whatever sweet it is or food it is or they just like it. We have a nefs, so we naturally desire. That comes naturally. The challenge actually is learning to restrain it. And so uh, sabr, the, the ability to restrain yourself, the scholars, when they speak about it, they say there's really three types of sabr. And in each one, there's the in, that, that element of, um, of self-restraint. They talk about al-sabru ala ta'a, which is patience in being obedient to Allah. And you might say, what? Yeah. Patience in the sense of self-restraint. You know when you're standing in taraweeh and you come and you say, I'm going to pray a certain number of rak'ah. After two rak'ahs, what do you, th you start thinking? You know what? I got work tomorrow, man. Maybe I should just bounce, right? Like, do I need to stay the whole time? It's only, it's only sunnah. It's like, it's just a nafal. It's, it's not fard. And you really start to have this conversation about I don't really need to do this. I prayed Isha, alhamdulillah, and I'll pray Fajr, so I'm good. But really what it is, is our nafs doesn't really want to stay engaged in the act of worship. And so what we have to learn to do is restrain ourselves from abandoning the act of worship, the obedience. And another probably more common example we have is when you have to lower your gaze. You see something and you notice it and you're like, okay, no, I can't look at that. And there's a part of you that wants to. And, and so this is really, it, it falls in two categories. It, it falls in the category of being, like restraining yourself to ensure that you're, you, you remain in the obedience of Allah. Through what? Through lowering your gaze. But it's also, the, the, the second category the scholars talk about is as-sabru anil ma'asiyah to restrain yourself from the disobedience of Allah. So you have, and in this case, it would be to restrain yourself from that desire to look at what you're not supposed to look at. And that's a form of sabr and self-restraint. And the third category is the category that we typically talk about uh, when we speak about sabr, which is as-sabru ala al-musibah, is to be patient in the face of difficulties and tribulations. As difficult as patience is, 
and you know you have psychologists and and writers now like Oliver Berkman. He calls patience a super a superpower, right? He says it's one of the most valuable um, traits and uh, skills a person can develop. The ability to just restrain yourself. And I think if we think about our lives and how many actions we perform either without even wanting to or despite not wanting to, we start to realize, yeah, this is proving to be more and more a really, really valuable skill. Because think about it. In your daily life, how many actions do you perform throughout the day that, number one, you, you don't want yourself to perform? Classic example, you pull out your phone. And you're like, why did I just do that? And, and sometimes we don't even stop to like kind of notice that we're doing it and we shouldn't do it. So one is like just if we catch ourselves, we go, yeah, I shouldn't be looking at my phone all the time. That's one. And then sometimes you're like, you know what? I'm not going to look at my phone for the next hour. And then what happens? Then the itch starts. But what if someone messaged? What if that email came through? Right? And so we struggle with, with dealing with that. So that's why writers now are talking about the ability to say what? I'm going to focus on this. I'm going to restrain myself from the different urges I have. I'm going to hold my tongue. I'm going to hold my, my body back from doing whatever it is that I compulsively feel like I need to do. It's almost like we're becoming a society of addictions. Where we just, we just feel compulsed, like as though we're, we're, we're forced by some type of, you know, uh, inner desire to do things that we don't want to do. And so patience, a sabr. And because it's so challenging, we understand why Allah in the Quran, he speaks about the reward of patience as being some of the rewards of patience you won't find with anything else. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He says, He says, you know, people who can, who can remain patient, they will re receive their reward without measure. Like you won't even be able to count it. You know, when we talk about rewards, we talk about 10 times for every good deed or up to 700 times, up to whatever. With sabr, Allah is saying, there's just no counting it. It's so, so great. It's so immense. بِغَيْرِ hisab. Allah says in the Quran, and this is such a beautiful one, because you know when you're trying to be patient, you're really upset about something, and you want to complain about it, but you also want to hold your tongue. You feel very alone. What do we get from complaining? If I complain to somebody, what happens? Relief, catharsis of letting it out. But then what do they often do for us? They validate it, right? They're like, yeah, you didn't deserve that. And then we feel what? We're not so alone. When you're trying to be patient, one of the most difficult things is the feeling of being alone. Someone says something to you and you want to lash back out at them. You want to say something back, but you hold your tongue. And you're like, I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. But then you have all these thoughts, this, this anger, this your frustration. And then you're like, maybe I should complain about it to somebody, right? Like, I, want, I want to vent to somebody. But sometimes in our venting, we end up backbiting. Like we're not even looking for any advice from them. We just want to let out the anger. And imagine we said, no, I don't want to backbite either. So I'm just going to hold my tongue. What do you feel? You feel so alone in your negative experience. And Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَ الصَّابِرِينَ That indeed Allah is with those who are patient. Allah is with those who are patient. In those moments where we desperately, we just want to lash out, we want to say something back, we want to vent to somebody and end up backbiting, if we are able to hold ourselves, we'll have Allah's support with us. And the moment we speak, and we let it out, and we fail to demonstrate patience, 
yeah, I might get validation from my friend who tells me, yeah, you don't deserve that. And that person is such a, you know, fill in whatever name you want. That person is such a terrible person. I got their support, but I lost out on Allah's. I lost out on the ma'iyya, the support of Allah being with me. I lose out on that. Allah says in the Quran, Wallahu yuhibbu sabirin. Allah loves those who show patience. Why? Because, and this is a principle in our religion, for the, for the most part, the amount of reward you receive will be in proportion to the amount of difficulty you have to go through for it. And so the harder something is, the more reward there tends to be for it. There are exceptions to this. There are exceptions to this. But typically speaking, Hajj is so great. Why? Because it's so hard. It is so difficult. It's expensive. And then it's tiring and exhausting. And then it's, you know, it's completely foreign. It's, it's uncomfortable in multiple ways. In terms of like the washrooms you use and you're sharing with like how many thousands of people from different parts of the world, strangers. And you're walking in like a desert and it's so hot. And there's so much reward for Hajj. You come back completely forgiven. All sins erased. Why? Because it was so difficult. And so sabr, when Allah says he loves those who demonstrate sabr, it's, it's because it's so difficult. Do you understand? Okay, the question then becomes, well, if it's really difficult, um, what might one do to develop the ability to be more patient? And I want to talk about that. But... When someone tells you to be patient, just in general, what happens? What's your response? Not your response. Not yours. Of course not yours. Just somebody. The average person's response when they're told, hey, be patient. What's, what, what goes through your mind? You get annoyed, right? Like, get out of here. I don't need to hear that right now. Right? We get really frustrated with people. Like, be patient. Like, oh, be patient. You know, like, go do your own thing. Like, it's tough, man. I'm in pain. Acknowledge how much pain I'm in. And subhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ, he teaches us in a hadith that, do you know when patience is truly demonstrated? In the init initial moments of pain. Because six months later, it's not usually that hard to be patient. Right? After venting for two weeks straight, it's usually not that much, you know, that, that difficult to be patient. It's in that initial moment where your temper flares and you become really upset or really hurt. It happened to the Prophet ﷺ, by the way, that he was passing by a graveyard and there was a woman who was crying and wailing by a grave. And it's prohibited. In our religion, it's prohibited to wail because what you're doing is you're objecting to God's decision. When a person wails, you can cry. Absolutely. It's permitted to cry it's permitted to grieve, but for someone to wail, and, and you see this in other parts of the world, they have people who wail on hire. Like you can rent them. You can pay them for like on, on a daily basis, and they'll come over for three days, and every day, they're strangers. I, I've seen this, by the way, so I'm not like making this up. Because what they want is for people to feel that this person who passed away was a great person. They're going to be missed. So they hire people to come, sit, and wail. This is prohibited. So this woman was wailing by the grave. And the Prophet ﷺ comes by and he says, Ittaqillaha wasbiri. A woman, fear Allah. Be patient. And you know what she says to him? She says, Ilayka anni. She said, get away from me. That's literally what it translates to. Ilayka anni. Go away. فَإِنَّكَ لَمْ تُصَبْ بِمُصِيبَتِي You don't know what I've been through. Man, like, that's just wrong on so many levels. Number one, tell the Prophet of Allah. She didn't know him, by the way, so to, to be fair. To tell the Prophet of Allah, go away. And then two, to say, you don't know my pain. I mean, this was a man who buried all of his children except one. He lost his mother at sick. Like, we can start talking about all the people he's lost. But he didn't do that. SubhanAllah, look at the emotional intelligence of the Prophet ﷺ. In that moment, he didn't, he didn't do that. 
he recognized this is a person in pain. And she's going to say some things. You know, people who are in pain, they often say things they don't mean. And down the line, when they kind of realize, they come back usually and they'll apologize. Hey, I, I, didn't, I didn't mean that. I was just really frustrated. I was really upset. And so that's what happens. That after she's done, someone tells her, hey, by the way, you know the man who passed by and told you to like, just be patient? That was the prophet of Allah. She completely was embarrassed. And she's like, where's his house? And so she, she went to his house. And the hadith, in the hadith it's mentioned, she expected, this is the prophet of God. So he's going to have like hella security and stuff. Nothing. She says, I came right up to his door. And I knocked on the door. And then when he came out, she said, I didn't know you. I, I didn't know it was you, O prophet of Allah. Like, I didn't mean what I said. I just didn't know who you were. And he says to her, he just says, you know, إِنَّمَا الصَّبْرُ عِنْدَ صَدْمَةِ الْأُولَى Patience is demonstrated in the initial moment of pain. See, now that she's kind of wailed and let out all her grief and really said whatever she needed to say, she kind of calmed down. Enough that she could come to the Prophet Sallallahu house and say what? Say, I'm sorry, O Prophet of Allah. And he's telling her, that you know what, true patience would have been demonstrated back there in that moment. And that's tough, is it not? Why might someone not be able to demonstrate that patience in that initial moment? What holds us back? Yeah. Yeah, all the way back there. No, 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 it's totally fine. I totally get you. My kids do it all the time. Okay, so what I'm understanding, if I were to summarize, it's your relationship with Allah. It depends on your relationship with Allah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge that point because I totally agree with you. Of course, it comes back to our relationship with Allah. But even our relationship with Allah is predicated on being self-aware enough to notice what we're feeling in the moment. See, as human beings, we have reactions. And some reactions come out without us even realizing. In order for a person to regulate their reaction, they have to first be aware of it. The hadith is telling us in that initial moment, that's where you show sabr. That's where you will have an impulse, almost guaranteed. If you're, if you're human, you have a heart, and you love the person who's you know, passing away or um, who's going through a difficulty, and you love them, you're going to have a great amount of pain. And there will be this impulse and reaction that will want to come out if you're just human. 
doesn't matter how pious you are. But if you cannot be aware of that enough that you can then regulate it, it'll come out. And you will fail to demonstrate sabr. Even if you have immense taqwa of Allah, but if you're not self-aware in the moment, the reaction will come out, and later on you'll come to your senses and go, yeah, yeah, astaghfirullah, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, and, then, and you'll turn to Allah. But by that time, you miss the window, that initial moment. So the way that we catch ourselves in the initial moment is to be aware. All self-transformation starts with this. To become aware, not only of our actions, but also our reactions. Not just our actions. I'm aware of, I'm going to do this. But also aware of, what impact did that person's words have on me? What, act, what impact did that person's you know, gaze when they looked at me? How did that affect me? And to become aware of that. And when you first start doing this, it can be a little tiring. How many of you experienced that? It's almost exhausting. You're constantly checking like, okay, why am I upset? Okay, why am I a little frustrated? And you're just constantly checking in, like literally inwards. It can be exhausting. But when you get to a point, you do it enough, you catch yourself. You, catch, you live in this state where you have one eye out at the world and one eye constantly observing what's going on within. And in that way, you begin to interact. And everyone has lapses and moments when they slip. Everybody. Everybody. But to, to begin to develop that, even just starting point. Yeah, go ahead. When does the acceptance come into play? Well, the acceptance is related, obviously, to your reaction. Your ability in the moment to accept it. But even to accept it, you have to have that moment of recognition of, hey, I'm going to... Because you could have the acceptance later on when you come to your senses. right? It's just to, but to not lose yourself in the pain because you don't, you don't allow the pain to swallow you. That's the point I'm trying to make here. That's the starting point. All the acceptance and turning to Allah, all that will come after. If we can just at least catch the initial um, reaction, right? And so, no, I'm not going to disagree with Sheikh Yasser Khaldi, you know what I'm saying? But that's, that's the point I was making. It's about the starting point being self-awareness. You know, a few of you brought up, yeah, go ahead. Patience and tolerance. Um, patience, tolerance in Arabic, the word is hilm. And that would usually, we'd use that when you are able to do something about it. So then you choose to tolerate. Whereas patience refers also, I think in English we'll use it also for you know, instances where you can do something about it. But oftentimes we use it in, in, in a context where you can't do anything you're kind of forced to accept it, but it hurts. And then we might want to complain and say a lot of different things, but we have to hold ourselves. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, we've been talking about Yaqub, the Prophet Yaqub, and Allah in the Quran mentions how he demonstrated beautiful patience, sabr jameel. And uh, Imam al Ghazali, he quotes one definition of beautiful patience. And this is incredible. He says, it's when the one who suffers misfortune, you know, the person grieving, when that person cannot be identified from the people around them. Meaning what? They're able to control and restrain their, themselves in such a way that the people around them don't even know. And that's a very high level. And it's not to say that if you don't reach that level that, okay, your patience is terrible. No. But it's to say, imagine a person gets to such a strong level of iman and uh, self-control self that 
but they don't object to Allah. They accept. It is what it is. It hurts greatly. And we see this with the Prophet ﷺ, right? Even the Prophet ﷺ in pain would cry. And he would acknowledge it. He'd say, you know, my eyes, they shed tears. My heart, it grieves. Because you can't control that. That's important to understand. You can't control tears. They will fall. What you can control is the words that you utter. So the Prophet ﷺ says, in my pain, I will be sure to not say anything that would displease Allah. And so how do you do that? How do you ensure that you don't say anything displeasing to Allah? One way that we can begin to try to, you know, bring more patience into our lives and demonstrate greater patience is to lessen the amount of complaining we do. How many of y'all would agree that we could do better if we lessen the amount of complaining? Agree? I mean, if you meet somebody who doesn't complain, don't we all admire such people? Like, man, that person? MashaAllah, we traveled. And sometimes it's like, what, is, is everything okay? Because nothing phases them. Right? So, you missed the train. It's like, alhamdulillah. And, you know, whatever, it's khair. Uh, you try to get the next one, it's, it's, it's broken down, it's not coming until a like, few hours later, alhamdulillah, right? Dinner's delayed, alhamdulillah. You're like, dude, life's tough. <laughs> like, you know, like this is, this is, this is, not, this is not alhamdulillah. Like, you have those moments where you feel that way. Yeah. Complaining is to, to say that it's wrong. It's to say that it's not supposed to be that way. And, you know, we are encouraged to complain to Allah. Ya Allah, I'm really experiencing difficulty in this situation. Ya Allah, even Yaqub, the Prophet Yaqub, that's what he did. إِنَّمَا أَشْكُوا بَثِّي وَحُزْنِي إِلَى اللَّهِ I will share my, my grief and my pain and my complaints to Allah. To Allah. But we're not permitted to complain about Allah. And, you know, we, we might say that, I don't do that. I don't ever say, like, you know, how could Allah do that to me? And sometimes we might, but I think for a lot of us, we'll say, I don't do that. But l let me give you an example here. It's not always, you know, how could Allah do that to me? That's the complaint we're talking about. The complaint I'm talking about when we say complaining about Allah is something like complaining about the life that Allah gave us. And I'll give you an example to explain this. Imagine someone comes to your house for dinner one night. Right? So they spend a few hours at your house, have a meal, spend time with you and your family. They leave. And once they leave, they complain. Not about you. Not about you. They're like, yo, the food, man, that was terrible. And like, what, what kind of comments, what kind of conversation do we have in the house they live in? And like, did you see that art piece of art? Like, what, what, what hideous image was that? How do you feel? They didn't talk about you. They didn't say anything about your weight or anything like that. They just talked about their experience at your house. And it was full of complaints. How do you feel? You feel like never inviting them again, right? That's the last time you ever stepped foot in my house. Even though they said nothing about you. They just talked about everything that you gave. The experience you tried to provide, they just complained about it. The food's terrible, and the, the, the sofas were too hard, and, you know, I went to the washroom, and, you know, they didn't have a bidet, and like, that is like, you know, like, what are you doing? That's kind of how we are in our lives. We may not complain about Allah himself, but if we're always complaining about the life that Allah gave us, and how it's just not good enough. It's not satisfactory. That's a form of complaining about Allah. Do you understand? It's a, it's a form of complaining about Allah. So when you meet people who never complain, how do you think they're able to do that? Yeah. Okay. 
So you said high consciousness, that closer they get to Allah, they're able to demonstrate higher patience. Okay, yeah, that's like a, it's a high spiritual level, right? Um, let's, if we can break down the anatomy of this a little bit more. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, whatever the outcome is, they're satisfied with it. My question is how? Because maybe someone's like, I want to be satisfied, but like, no, <laughs> like I can't. This is terrible. Do you get what I'm trying to ask here? I get what you're saying. Like that is an example of not complaining. I'm wondering what does it take for someone to just not complain? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, beautiful. For some, they're always thinking about reward. That you know what? If we go through this difficulty, Allah will reward us. And that's, that's a very powerful force, subhanAllah. You know that's called ihtisab. Expecting reward from Allah, that gives you immense strength to get through something because it makes it worth it. Why suffer for no reason? No one wants to do that. But if you can find a reason to suffer, because you're kind of forced to suffer, right? So, but let's just find meaning in it. Okay, I have to suffer through this. If I can remind myself that hey, I'm going to re receive so much reward for being patient, it makes it worth it. Yeah. What's another way, people? Go ahead. Right, being, being more grateful makes it easier to be patient. But you know that's really challenging. Because it feels like, <sighs> you're just telling me, look for the silver lining. That's what it sounds like, I'm sure, for many of us. Do you know what I mean? But the scholars talk, say exactly that. I'll, I'll mention that. So you're absolutely right, by the way. But some of us might have that feeling of like, uh, silver lining, everything silver lining. But no. Yeah. Yeah. A skill that you can develop. Okay, so they've worked on it, you're saying. Okay, beautiful. Behind you. Okay, so you're thinking about like the practicalities. Hey, if I complain, it's not going to bring the train back. You missed the train, you missed the train. Right. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Learning names of Allah. Do you know anywhere we can do that? What are you guys laughing for? Uh, it's a good one. Yeah, beautiful. I totally agree. I'm, I'm biased, but I agree. Go ahead. SubhanAllah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. Reward, yeah. Make you less deserving of? Oh, the question is, if you do something with the expectation of receiving reward, does it, does it make you less deserving of the uh, reward? No. Because we're taught you should expect reward. You should hope for reward. Essentially, when it comes to people, for example, who are able to just not complain, usually they're able to find a different perspective. Because look, everybody sees the, the misfortune, the mistrain. I see it, this person sees it, we all see it. Because objectively, we miss the train. The question then becomes, what's in my control? I can't control the train, it's gone. I can control my perspective on the situation. So one perspective is, hey, it's reward. For the patience that I display right now, reward. Another perspective is, okay, you know, we get a few. You ever seen people do that? Well, I guess we'll just get some more time here. I guess we'll just chill over here for a little bit more and come back for the next train. And so they trying to find a different angle from which to look at the situation. And it could be a deeply spiritual lens. It could be a practical lens. But really, shifting perspective is key to this. And we find this in the people of the past. Um, and I'll share with you from... Um, from, it's, uh, from Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an. He says, whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala test me with a test, he said, I always found four blessings in it. That's incredible. He didn't say like, I found four ways to cope. 
He said, no, I found four blessings. Number one, he says, أَنَّهُ لَمْ يَكُنْ فِي دِينِي He goes, that I, I, I was grateful and I was, I was really, really, um, I felt blessed that this difficulty or challenge did not pertain to my deen. Meaning what? And this is known as anchoring. You know when you start to spiral, can you anchor yourself? You know, you're going, let's say you're going on a vacation and then like one of your luggages doesn't come and it sucks. But what do you do? You say, you know what? But at least we're here, right? You find something to anchor your happiness in so you don't just go down this gloomy spiral. You say, you know what? But at least we're, we're in good weather. People in Canada are still struggling, right? Like we got good weather over here in whatever country it is. You find a way to not let yourself spiral. And that's what you see him doing here. He said, you know what? I lost something of the world, like my, my tire's flat, but hey, at least I still got my Iman. I still, I still, I didn't miss my prayer, right? Number two, he says, the second blessing I find in every difficulty is what? That it, it wasn't greater than it was. Yeah, my tire's flat. That could have been two tires. No, really, it could have been two. And you might say, well, what do you mean? Well, you didn't want one to go flat. It wasn't up to you. So since it wasn't up to you, it could have been two. Alhamdulillah, it was only one. Right? That's why when we see somebody who's going through a difficulty, we actually thank Allah. Alhamdulillah, alladhi afani mimma abtalahu bihi. All praises to Allah who saved me from their difficulty. And sometimes it comes at the best times. And I know that sounds like a little bit of a strange statement, but what I mean is, Sometimes you're kind of going through a tough time, driving down the highway, and you see somebody in like a crash. You're like, was I complaining about the waiter back at the restaurant? Like, alhamdulillah, like I'm saved from that. Like, what is what is someone putting ranch when I didn't want ranch? Like, what, well, it's not a really big deal. Compared to what I'm seeing this, it reminds you sometimes like, yo, my problems are not as, they could have been worse. Number three, he says, I'm grateful. And I feel blessed that I'm able to accept it. If, he says, if I find myself in a difficulty and I just say, Alhamdulillah. He says, that to me is a blessing. The fact that I did not object. And number four, he says, the blessing is if I'm able to hope for reward from Allah for it. That if I can do that in the face of difficulty, I know I came out, I came out victorious. You know, a man came to one of the pious, Sahal bin Abdullah at Tustari, and he came to him and he said, um, he said, uh, a thief entered my house and he took my furniture. And Sahal bin Abdullah, he said, uh, you know, be grateful. He said, what if shaitan came into your heart and stole your iman? Then what would you do? It's like, yo. I mean, that's, that's a, I mean, I'm not saying that's what you need to tell your friend tomorrow. Right? Your friend's like, yo, I got fired from my job. And you're like, yo, thank God you didn't get fired from Jannah. Right? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's not what you're supposed to say. But look at the perspective. SubhanAllah. Anchor. What's your anchor? For many parents, you know what their anchor is? It's their kids at home. The world can, like, whatever's happening. And you just come home, you walk in the door, and you just see your kids. And it's like, no problems, man. No, seriously. What's your anchor, right? Um, yeah, it's, it's getting late now. So I'm going to pause. I had I a lot more I wanted to talk about, but I'm, I'm actually really grateful that you guys are sharing your thoughts and we're, we're really engaging in a conversation. Um, I'm going to finish with a poem. Can we do that? I'll read a poem to you. I didn't write it. Don't, don't stress. Like, I didn't write it. So inshallah, it should be good. Um, it's from Khalil Gibran. Anyone read Khalil Gibran? Uh, he says, and I think it's such a profound one. So we're not going to spend time reflecting on it, but I want to share it with you so that maybe you could go back and reflect because I think it's deep. It's from his famous, you know, long, you could say, collection of poetry called The Prophet. And it's not about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But it's, it seems to resemble it in some ways, interestingly. He said, a woman spoke saying, tell us of pain. And he said, your pain is the breaking of the shell that encloses your understanding. 
even as the stone of the fruit must break, that its heart may stand in the sun, so must you know pain. And could you keep your heart in wonder at the daily miracles of your life? Your pain would not seem less wondrous than your joy. And you would accept the seasons of your heart, even as you have always accepted the seasons that pass over your fields. And you would watch with serenity through the winters of your grief. Now, y'all ready for this one? Please put your life jackets on as we get towards the end of this poem here. He goes, much of your pain is self-chosen. Much of your pain is self-chosen. It is the bitter po potion by which the physician within you heals your sick self. Therefore, trust the physician and drink his remedy in silence and tranquility. For his hand, though heavy and hard, is guided by the tender hand of the unseen. What's this talking about? There's a statement from Imam al-Junaid where he defines patience as what? Swallowing. Tajarru'ul mararati min ghayri ta'bis. It's to swallow the bitter taste of the difficult circumstance without even letting your facial expression change. This is an interesting analogy. It's like medicine. Have you ever tried to give a child medicine? Children are very interesting. Because how many of you have had a child who's coughing during the night? Anyone? Like a sibling maybe? I'm the only parent here. So, you know, their children start coughing during the night. So we try to go and give them some medicine. They want to stop coughing. They want to go back to sleep, right? The child wants to go back to sleep. But you go to give them medicine and they fight. They're like, no, you become the enemy. And they'll cry. And, you know, my daughter, my youngest, she loves saying this. Hamna, she goes, you're not being nice. That's her classic line. You're not being nice. I'm like, I'm literally being nice. Like, that's why I'm giving you this. So you can go to sleep, but you can't reason. And why is it that they resist? They want healing, but they don't want the bitterness of the medicine. Even if you bring, like, the, the, the sweet one, they're still like, no, it's medicine. In their mind, it's bitter. They don't want it. That's how we are sometimes. When Allah will bring a difficulty in our life, and it'll be bitter. But hey, subhanAllah, maybe it's through that difficulty that we will grow. We will heal. We will realize our flaws. We will, we will be able to overcome. But we are like that what? That child saying what? I don't want this. No, I don't want the. I want the growth, but I don't want the bitterness. I want the peace of heart, but I don't want the bitterness of the situation. Sabr is the means of growth. How? Because sabr is how you can bear the bitterness of the medicine. And you don't even make a facial expression. You know when as adults, we're just like, it's bitter, but I got to do it. And if anything, we start asking people, hey, you got medicine? We're looking for the medicine. We're not actually looking for the medicine. We're looking for the healing. And we recognize that to get that healing, you have to go through the bitterness. That's what he's saying in the poem. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding of the value of patience and the reward of patience. And may he grant us the ability to become self-aware enough that we can demonstrate that patience in those initial moments when we are faced with misfortunes and calamities. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Jazakumullah khair guys for spending this time with me and sharing your thoughts. That's really, really valuable. Um, there was a lot more I could have talked about, but honestly, I, I learned so much from our conversations and getting the different perspectives. And I think it really enriches uh, our Thrive sessions. So please, inshallah. I encourage you every week to come and share your thoughts as we go along, inshallah. All right, guys? We'll see you next time, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.